thank you. All right, so one thing I just wanted to show you is in the pack, you've got this handy little uh, take-home guide. So if you want a quick guide to what we're talking about today, it's a great place to start. So um, obviously the three of us are going to, to split this talk up. Um, I'm going to talk to you a bit about the background. Um, and one of the first things that I wanted to say to you is that this is a bit of a Marmite method. People tend to love it or hate it. Um, and it's also kind of a new method still. So part of what we want to do is to introduce it to you and we hope that you're going to love it. But we're going to talk a little bit about some of the reasons why people don't like it. Um, it's, uh, we're going to start by showing you uh, an example of a story stem from Ginny and Victoria's uh, research using this method on um, body hair removal practices, just so that you get a bit of a flavour right up front about what this method is about. Ah. Sorry. <coughs> All right, so um, the cue is that Jane has decided to stop removing her body hair. Um, obviously, the, uh, we give them some instructions, and the instructions in this case are quite simple. Please uh, read and complete the following story. Um, spend at least 10 minutes writing the story. It's quite important when you're working with students, which um, Nikki will go on and talk about, I think, uh, to say things like that. Um, the uh, um, thing that I think is important to say at this point is that story completion is quite different from some other ways of collecting data. So the, most of the methods that are used traditionally in qualitative research interviewing and focus groups and quite a few of the methods, the methods that are being used today, including qualitative surveys and email <coughs> interviews that other people are presenting here, um, actually are about people's personal experience. This is quite different. You're asking people to tell stories so it's not about uh, uh, their, own, their own stuff. So it, it starts in quite a different place, and that's possibly one of the reasons that people, some people don't, don't like it at all, because, okay, it's a story. How can you analyse that? What's that about? Okay, so what we're going to do is uh, talk a bit about um, the history and the background of this as a method and the development of it as a qualitative method, because that's not where it started. Um, Nick is going to talk some about um, design and uh, sampling in this kind of research because there are some really interesting methodological issues that you need to think about. And uh, Vic's going to talk about the analysis stage and do some conclusions. Um, we've got a picture of Ginny, who you know, so we wanted to uh, uh, make sure that we include her because she's part of the, the group that we've had over a few years doing research with this methodology. And we wanted to have a picture of Ermgard um, uh, Tishner, who's also a researcher at UWE but couldn't be here today. And we wanted to mention Matt, who I saw a minute ago. Where's Matt? Matt Wood is a, a, a prior student but now doing his PhD in Newcastle. Very exciting. <laughs> anyway, so I wanted to credit him. And also Iduna Beckley Shah, who uh, has just uh, successfully defended her PhD using this method. So this is our kind of credit sort of part of the speech. All right, so in terms of the background, I'm a practitioner by training, I'm a counselling psychologist, and um, I came, I love objective techniques, and I came across them in my training because I was trained to do the raw shark and the TAT. So projective techniques are um, when you give somebody a bit of stimulus material and it's deliberately ambiguous and you get them to make sense of the material. So this slide on the bottom is from the raw shark um, protocol. People often say it looks like a wolf, I won't tell you what it is says about you if you do or don't see that one. <laughs> um, uh, the, the key, I think, issue about this is the assumption, because it's a psychoanalytic tradition, is that there is this person of which who's, who's only a little bit aware of themselves, hence the sort of classic <coughs> iceberg image, and that what you're using when you're using a raw shark or a, or a projective test if you're getting them to give you data that they're not actually aware of, so you're reading their responses in terms of telling you things that they are not conscious of, that's part of their unconscious, and or material that they would feel uncomfortable telling you directly. Um, so the raw shark has been used in pretty awful ways. So it was used, for example, in the 70s um, to diagnose homosexuality or lesbianism, not so great. Um, I want to say in the Royal Sharks defence, because I love it, there's a strong empirical tradition, it's quite useful, um, and it's um, useful clinically. I used it very uh, once with a bank robber, 
in prison, and that was kind of fun. So it's it's a good it's got it's a good instrument with a long empirical tradition within a very particular clinical positivist uh, uh, context. But what we're doing here is something very different. The other research tradition that is important for projectives is the idea of projectives being used in the context of developmental psychology. So the one that I think is most um, it's used. It was being. It's been used for a while now by attachment researchers. So there's a picture here of John Bowlby, obviously, who's the originator of attachment research. Um, and the the most famous ones are kind of doll play stories that you do with kids of about six or seven to code their attachment. So you've got, you know, got the kid. You 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 act out a wee story. You know, there's you little Johnny, and here's your parents. And oops, we spilt the orange juice all over the floor what's happening next and then you pass the dolls over and you get the kid to act it out and then you code them in various ways based on their response. I think the thing to say about the use of both the Rorschach and uh, traditions uh, and, and the kind of doll play type stuff is the, there are these very complex coding systems that are used to make sense of this complex storied textual verbal data and what you end up with often is a few numbers or or something that can be then coded in a quantitative analysis and I always think it's a bit of a shame because you take it all down and you shrink it to one thing or a few numbers so in terms of uh, the development of stroke completion as a qualitative research tool the um, origins of it are probably this person I'm just going to turn the page whose name is Martina Horner, and she was um, a, a, a researcher in the US um, who did this paper in the 70s. Um, and she was very influenced by psychoanalysis, quotes Freud in the paper, for example. And she gave her participants, uh, her female participants, this story stem after first term finals and finds herself at the top of the medical school class, and then she gave a John version to the boys. Um, and then she um, analysed it and came up with an analysis that argued that women were scared of success. Now, you know, given the time that we're talking, unsurprisingly, there was a huge feminist backlash. And um, Victoria, I'm just uh, riffling through this, Vic said to me that uh, part, of, part of the response that uh, she and Ginny have had from a story completion paper from a reviewer was that the reveal was still haunted by the memory of Horner's over-interpretation of the data. So this is one of the reasons it's, mar it's Marmite, because this method has been used to argue things that one might um, see as being possible to interpret in other ways, shall I say, diplomatically. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so the, possibly because it was um, not used, uh, because it had, had created such an uproar, the method wasn't used then for quite a long time until 95, in Australia, so this is Susan Moore here, um, second picture down, and she was doing a big study on uh, 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 MENA and, and uh, used story completion as one of a series of things that she did. It's quite a complex story completion. There are five different stems. This is the first one. Jenny rang Sue to ask her to go to swim. She's got a period. What can you do? Um, and what she was interested in is um, how the story stems um, said something about how the, the, the female participants felt about uh, periods. So she identified common themes such as deception, embarrassment, anxiety, illness, support from others, and problem solving. So basically, thank you, um, both of these methods are, are using a kind of essentialist or realist frame. Um, the uh, third method is uh, Deborah, uh, uh, sorry, Deborah Powell and Celia Kitzinger, Kitzinger. and um, they are the first people who are using the method in a way that's more questioning, who suggest that, uh, they wrote this paper, they explicitly referenced Horner, they talked about the fact that there are two ways to use this method. You can interpret the data as saying something real about the people so the stories that you tell, sell, tell me something about who you are. The other alternative is to say that the stories that you tell, tell me something about the social constructions around a topic. That's a very different way of understanding it. And what they demonstrate in this paper is two different ways of reading data around infidelity. Now, because Ginny's told me I'm uh, out of time and I need to stay on time, just going to say that this is a list of some of the research and it's a small body of research, predominantly by feminist researchers, 
um, that has been published. So although we're all working in it, it's still quite a small number of published studies. Um, this is a bit about that Kitzinger and Powell uh, research. And there are two other reasons why people often hate this method, or are mar it's Marmite for them, is one that um, it's uh, about the fact that you can use these percentages. So there's this notion that you, if you report numbers in quant, it's really awful because that's like, what are you doing? Some kind of content analysis. But actually, when you've got hundreds of data, you can do that. And that's really quite interesting. It tells you something kind of interesting about the data. And the second thing is that this original study is a comparison. So you've got boys and girls responding to male and female STEM. So that, if you think about it as a chi-square, it's four different groups, which means that you can do analysis that's based at looking at the difference between male and female respondents or responses to men and women. Okay? So again, that seems quite quantitative, quite positive. It can be a reason why people don't like the method. All right. Thank you. Okay, so moving on to talking about our work, between us, and Victoria very much started this, but we've been teaching story completion tasks as a way of collecting quality data at UWE for around about the last 10 years. We've been teaching to undergraduates and to postgraduates. We've sent undergraduates out and asked them to get their parents to complete story completion tasks for data for assignments they complete. And what we found is that it is a really popular method and that a lot of our second year undergraduate students go on having learnt this in their second year at uni to want to do their projects in their final year using story completion tasks. And so one of the papers that was on the list that Naomi just showed you was um, a report of Eleanor Walsh's undergraduate project, which her and her supervisor, Helen, who's going to be speaking later, wrote up and managed to get published. So we do see lots and lots of students now coming through and using story completion tasks. And that's one of the reasons why Victoria and Ginny decided that this method, although it's not really published very much at the moment, seems to be something that's really appropriate to include when we're talking about the types of methods that students can use in, when they're collecting quality data. And that's why they put it into their successful qualitative research book. So um, what's happened more recently is that a couple of years ago, a group of us got together and we started thinking that this was a really interesting method and we started really messing around with it a little bit. So here's the people that were involved in our story completion research group. Um, and we've really just been trying to publicise the method a little bit. We've done some talks, we've written a chapter in the book, um, and we've been playing around with it. And I guess that's also one way just to kind of warn you that we don't necessarily have all the answers. It's not that well used, and it's a method that has lots of potential and lots of opportunity to have some fun with it. But let's have a go at talking about design and sampling and so on in story completion research. So we think it's particularly useful when what you're trying to get to is meaning making around a particular topic. So some people have used it through a constructionist lens, although it doesn't have to be. So you could be exploring understandings and perceptions or you could be moving into more social and discursive um, understandings and, and discourses that you might find in your data. It's particularly useful if you're trying to explore dominant assumptions about a topic because you're not getting to that topic directly. It's a kind of indirect route into getting responses about a particular topic. So an example of this would be um, really socially desirable topics where if participants are given a, a questionnaire, um, they would easily know what the correct answer was um, in a kind of um, equality climate. Um, so, for example, homophobia scales and things like that, you tend to get floor effects. Everybody who takes part in that questionnaire will know what the kind of correct socially desirable answer is to give. Um, but that isn't really the case with story completion um, because your cues are less explicit. Um, and also, you're not asking them to actually own what they're writing you're setting it in a hypothetical context and asking them to write a story about a character rather than actually asking them to own what they're writing. So it can be really useful for that. The other thing that we found is that it's very useful <coughs> for um, sensitive topics as well. Um, so some of the research that has been published has been around things like sex offenders, um, orgasmic absence, so some really kind of personal and, and sensitive topics that it can be used for. Another thing that's quite unusual about it is that there is the potential 
for doing some kind of comparison, which Naomi referred to just a moment ago. So returning to Victoria and Ginny's body hair um, story completion, um, their intention was to have a look at the responses of male and female participants to the stories and the ways in which people made sense of Jane removing her body hair and David removing his body hair. But when it came to it, that actually wasn't necessarily the most interesting thing that came out of their data. Um, and I'll leave Victoria to talk about that a little bit more in a moment um, when we talk about analysis. <coughs> but there is the potential for unexpected responses and for not being quite sure what you get. And that may be another reason why it's a kind of Marmite method as well that can be embraced, but it can also be a bit daunting when you're not quite sure what's going to be coming out of that. So you can potentially do those kind of um, comparisons between different groups to the same story, and you can see whether changing a key feature of your story means that you get different responses. So you could change the sexuality of your character, the bodily ability of your character, but the way that it's been explored mostly, this kind of comparative design, is with gender. So there's lots of potential there for going out and looking at other comparative designs to see what sorts of responses you get. And then also thinking about sample size. Um, sample size has ranged hugely, um, somewhere between 20 and 200 participants. If you've got comparative designs where you've got multiple stories or you've got um, multiple groups of people that you want to respond to your stories, then you start to need more people to have the bulk of data, um, to be looking at, at a kind of good, good body of data. The other thing that happens is that sometimes people ask participants to respond to just one version, but sometimes people have asked their participants to respond to up to six versions. So you can end up needing a lot of people to take part. Um, again, re returning to the body hair example, Julia and Victoria collected around about 200 responses, 100 to each of the, the um, scenarios. And they found that was, that was kind of appropriate. There was enough there to get some diversity um, and to have some kind of different stories coming through. But it wasn't so much that they felt completely overwhelmed by the data. So I'll hand over to Victoria to talk about how, once you've got your data, you might go about analysing it. <coughs> OK, so the most common way to analyse data is to look for um, horizontal patterns. So looking across the stories to identify patterns in the data. And most story completion research, and bear in mind we're talking about quite a small body of research, has either used thematic analysis and in a couple of studies discourse analysis, but with a focus on kind of looking at patterns. Um, so this is an example. I should say that um, Hannah Frith, Myself and Ginny were all senior kit singers, um, PhD students, so that's where our love of story completion comes from, from our um, hugely innovative um, PhD supervisor. Um, so Hannah's research, looking at orgasmic absence in the context of heterosexual relationships, and looking at three themes across the data. I won't kind of talk about them in great detail. If you're interested in the papers and want to find out more about them, you, I've got a slide at the end, you can email me to get the information. So what you notice is these things kind of cut across and identify meanings across the stories. The other thing that's a bit more common is um, doing a more structured analysis. So rather than just being quite open and exploratory and identifying themes, is to start by having some questions that you want to ask of the data and those questions structuring how you do <coughs> your thematic analysis. And the reason why this is quite common is because this is what Kitzinger and Powell did in um, <coughs> their study. So they looked at depictions of the Q relationship, reasons for infidelity and responses to infidelity. So they had those three questions and then they identified thematic patterns in relation to those three questions. So, for example, with the Jane data, when Jane stops removing her body hair, um, it was a hugely varied data set. Um, very, very different stories, varied widely from kind of fantasy stories where 
Jane is part yeti and goes to live in the wild with her father, who's full yeti and embraces her hairy body. <laughs> um, and then kind of more kind of straightforward mundane stories. And so what we decided that would work in terms of analysis was asking three questions. The reasons why Jane stopped removing body hair. What kind of woman stops removing body hair? So how they constructed Jane. And there was lots of really interesting things in the data about how Jane was portrayed and how they made sense of a woman engaging in something which is socially not normative. And then also more broadly looking at the meanings of body hair for women. And so the one that always makes me laugh, which is why I put it up on here, is that um, unmanaged pubic hair becomes wild and animalistic. So there are lots of descriptions of massive bushes and things like that. And I do apologise if this is all a bit much for you, but um, I'm a sexuality researcher and a bit desensitised to <laughs> talking about that kind of thing. The other different thing that we've played around with is trying to analyse the data in a way that captures the patterning in the stories. So the reason why I talked about horizontal patterns is because another thing we thought about is vertical patterns, so patterns in how the stories unfold. And what's really fun about story completion is the unpredictability of the data, but sometimes you get such um, consistency in how the story is written. And it's really hard to predict as to whether you'll get that consistency or not. So you won't be able to see this very well, but um, we can send out the slides. This is an example from an undergraduate student project I supervised. And the story stem was um, a young woman coming out as lesbian or bisexual to her parents. And so the, the completions tended to focus on the um, parental reaction and then how the family came to some kind of resolution of that um, new information. And what we were able to kind of map out in the data is a kind of patterning in how the stories unfolded. So most of the stories had the parents being shocked at this disclosure. And that was a fairly uniform reaction in the vast majority of stories. Then we develop through either the parents having a positive reaction and welcoming this information, or having a negative reaction. And then the stories can end in various different ways. So if the parents, <coughs> after their initial shock, react positively, the stories always had a positive ending of um, welcoming um, this information, welcoming, um, I think the character was called Sarah, welcoming her girlfriend into the family and so on. But if there was an initial negative reaction, they could end in one of three ways, either positively, negatively, or ambiguously. So the student did a thematic analysis, but complemented it with this kind of vertical pattern mapping technique to retain a sense of the, the storied nature of the data. Um, to give you another example very quickly, um, what was really striking about the Jane and David data is the Jane data was hugely varied. It was all over the shop, and there was no kind of distinct kind of story going on. The David data was incredibly uniform. <coughs> it was almost like we told them what they should put in their stories because they were so uniform. Um, so David was always characterised as a young heterosexual man who was very hairy, in the wrong places on his body, um, that he was teased and bullied for being too hairy, um, that he sees images of sexy men in the media and sexy men are all hairless, and he has an interest in a particular girl or wants a girlfriend and feels that he's not sexy enough because he's too hairy. Um, so he decides to remove his body hair. And that was very uniform. What was different is how they end, and we had two distinct endings. On the one hand, David is punished in some way for being over-invested in appearance, for putting too much emphasis on the outside. Um, so, for example, he has an allergic reaction to the cream, <laughs> removal cream, collapsed naked um, <laughs> outside the bathroom, and his parents take him to a hospital in an ambulance. <laughs> And then in other stories, it all ends happily, 
and he gets the girl he likes or he gets a girlfriend. So there seems to be some, it speaks to some kind of ambivalence around kind of masculinity there. So that's an example of a story mapping technique and that how we would present the analysis, when we ever get around to writing it up, would be to retain that kind of storied structure in writing up the analysis. The other thing that hasn't really been explored, which is why we have a question mark, is narrative analysis. To me, to all of us, it seems the obvious method for analysing story completion data um, could take this very kind of straightforward story mapping technique and um, extend and develop it. But we aren't narrative analysis. Uh, um, we aren't um, narrative analysts, so we're kind of waiting for someone to come along and say, hey, I'll do this, I'll have a go at this. So any takers, let us know. <laughs> Just very, very quickly, some of the other possibilities. So um, an example here is combining story completion with visual methods. So this is Nikki and Matt's research looking at perceptions of appearance um, using story completion. Um, so people were given a scenario about a young woman preparing for a date. And then after they wrote their story, they were directed to bit strips. Um, the animation website, which is hugely fun, and asked to create an image of the character. And then mm -hmm. you can see here kind of three of the images that were created. Um, lots of technical and practical issues with doing some, something like this, but nonetheless, I think it signals that story completion doesn't have to end with getting people <coughs> just the right stories. There are mm -hmm. lots of possibilities for combining story mm -hmm. completion with other approaches. So, how are we doing for time? A couple more minutes. Okay, good. So, some kind of... Oh, ah, it's gone wrong. Okay. Conclusions. So, it's a great method if you are in a pressured academic environment, which we all are, you haven't got much time, you haven't got much money, but you still want to do really good, complex, qualitative research. So, it makes data collection quite straightforward and easy. So you can invest all your time in analysing the data. You can collect data online, so you can use things like Qualtrics and SurveyMonkey, so you can get people to write stories online. Obviously, it depends on the population that you're collecting data from. And you can get large samples quickly and efficiently. We've mostly collected data from students. They're obviously used to writing stories. Um, they're used to typing on computers. Um, we sometimes gone into big lecture theatres and asked them to participate and in that one shot of half an hour you get kind of 150 kind of completions so it's relatively quick. Um, the student um, Naomi mentioned, Aduna, has used story completion with a general population sample and with therapists and it did seem to work quite well but we're interested in people using the method on other populations so we can understand how it works with a non-student population. It's great for perceptions, great for constructions, but not personal experience, unless you combine it with something else. Um, it's great for sensitive, um, ethically, morally complex topics. Um, that's one of the reasons why we think it's really good for student research, because they can really get stuck into complex topics, but we don't worry about the fact that they're going off to interview people where they don't have the skills and training and experience to do that. So if students come to me and say, oh, I want to do something on domestic violence, and I want to interview people who have experienced domestic violence, like, no, this is an undergraduate project, that's not going to happen, but how about do a story completion? Um, so it's non-intrusive, less kind of ethically challenging. And the thing I really love is it's fun, and research should be fun, it should be playful, as far as I'm concerned, and it's fun for the participants. I will often get, I've got a study up on the participant pool here at Ewing at the moment, I'll often get students email me afterwards and say, I just want to say, that was really fun, I really enjoyed that. So it's fun for participants, but it's also fun for researchers as well. There are, very briefly, some downsides. The data is unpredictable, but I find that really exciting. You never know what you're going to get. We didn't know the David data would all be really storied, and the Jane data would be all over the shop. And that, to me, is exciting, but it can also be daunting. There's a huge variation in how people complete stories. You can get two lines, you can get rings with dialogue and, <laughs> <laughs> and narratives extending over long periods of time. So people can engage very differently with it. 
Um, and it, as we've kind of highlighted, it's new. So there's still lots we don't know, but we hope we can encourage you to play with it. Just to signal some resources, um, as Nikki mentioned, we cover it in our book that hopefully will be on sale at lunchtime. We've got um, story completion data sets on our companion website for use in teaching and also research materials if you want to do your own story completion research. We've got some chapters coming out. Hopefully we'll be presenting story completion research at the Southwest Quali Symposium. And at some vague point in the future, we will write a book on it. So there is a contract, but you know, there's several books in front of it before we get there. So just to leave you with this, if you want all the papers I've cited, if you want these slides, if you want some slides from other talks, just send me an email, and I've got the email ready to go to send back to you. Okay, Ginny's been waving at me for some time, so I'll leave it there.